Okay. Hello everyone. So I see a couple of familiar faces from the sessions, which is good. Does anyone hear me talking? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. That's always reassuring if people have to listen to me blabbering. So let's see if at least our, our speakers are here. So I see Sander, I see Franz, I see Emre, I see co-organizer Dan, and we have Miss Julia. Julia, I don't see Claudia. No Claudia. Well, we just wait a couple more minutes. Then do you have an eye on the discussion session on the on the crowdcast, just in case there are no people waiting in there? I left um I left a message in that to say that we would be uh, here. Awesome. Okay, thanks a lot. Hello everyone. Hello. Hey. All right, then we I think we'll just get started never the lesson and see hopefully some of the people will trickle in over time. So the idea is really um, to replace a little bit the the discussion part that we normally have at a workshop over a beer or a cup of tea after the talks with the Zoom and uh, let's see how that goes. And as already said, the idea was to talk a little bit about um, the focus of many of the talks today, which was clearly technical. So we've seen several talks today actually, which did basically use auto differentiation and then often in combination with surrogate gradients or with spike times to train spike neural networks. And probably most of these works were also relying heavily on GPUs. So to me, it seems a lot of what we're experiencing now in the spiking world and the, a lot of these successes are really driven by technology that has become available to us through deep learning really. And I still remember the good old days where uh, we wrote our spiking neural networks in simulators like Nest, Brine or esoteric developments such as my own Orin. Um, and clearly these simulators they had certain advantages because they were event-based and in a way actually much more parsimonious uh, using in, of resources. And uh, now we've all switched to these auditive frameworks uh, that enable us to actually get spiking on networks to do something. But to me, a big and open question is really, um, what are at the moment the technological bottlenecks that really hold us back? One, from applying spiking on networks um, in, for instance, neuromorphic hardware, and two, um, from actually now using them to do computational neuroscience research and asking really biologically inspired questions about how processing in such networks really works. And um, that's really what I want to um, discuss with you in the beginning of this session. And I think since we are, yeah, by now almost 100 participants in the chat, I would suggest that um, if you are a speaker, then feel free to just blabber away whenever you want to answer one of my questions. Um, if you are not a speaker, then I would uh, suggest you use the raise your hand feature in Zoom. And I don't know if everybody knows where that is. Um, I clearly can't see it anymore because probably I'm host. But if you go to the participants list, um, there at the bottom, there should be usually some icons where you can say, uh, raise your hand. And you can also say, go faster if I'm boring you too much. Uh, and that way you will pop up and that way not everybody needs to unmute their microphone if you have either a question or if you want to contribute an answer to, to something. And uh, let's see how that goes. So let's start um, with maybe my first question to the panel is, uh, what developments do you think would move the field forward the most at the moment? Uh, your particular field that you're working on. 
And um, yeah, perhaps the question is mostly now to today's speakers, but everybody else who has an opinion is also welcome to join. Yeah, really mean for technology. Hi, yes. Yeah, so, so I, I can start. Uh, so um, in terms of technologies, you mentioned the GPUs, which um, we're using spiking and network spending a lot of power doing multiplications by zero. Um, and this is actually not a limitation of auto differentiation. In fact, if you look at the auto no, yes? Sorry, it's very hard to hear you. Really? Okay. Okay, now it's better. Okay. Um, is there an echo? Or? Yes, yes. Yeah, we're getting uh -huh. quite a lot of feedback. feedback coming through. Yeah, that was me. Sorry, sorry. Uh huh. Is it better is now? Better? Uh, yeah, I don't hear my echo anymore. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, so uh, just speak up again if it's not clear. Okay. Um, so, so, yeah, so we do a lot of multiplications by zeros on GPUs, but it turns out that this is not a limitation of auto differentiation. In fact, if you're looking at literature, you know, dealing with sparse Jacobians is uh, really uh, something that the community has done successfully. Um, so what we need is basically hardware that can basically do all these computations that are, uh, you know, not as well ordered as you have um, uh, and don't fit very well on GPUs. And the, it turns out there's also some hardware out there that's, uh, um, less GPU-like, uh, you know, such as the uh, Graph Core IPUs or the Cerberus uh, wafer scale systems, which are really well adapted. In fact, they have sparse linear algebra uh, processors. So uh, we're in the process of you know, working with Cerberus, also figuring out how we can use that kind of um, software for spiking neural network simulation. I think that might make a huge uh, difference. Uh, so there are new technologies out there, and I think a lot of exciting things to look at. What, what are the key factors that enable these technologies? They are uh, basically, uh, well, for Cerberus, it's, it's a wafer scale system that basically has, uh, again, memory and processing at the same location. So every, all this, the whole story I told you about in-memory computing is, and in fact, these different auto differentiation mechanisms is key to the success of, of that hardware. And it's also training hardware. It's not only for inference like you would have on an edge DP or something like that. So that's, uh, that, 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 that makes a big step. And it's, honestly, it's just the interest put into uh, building uh, alternative hardware systems for building large networks, you know, such as GPT-3 and so on. This is not a new market uh, approach per se. Right, and you would very much argue that we need these large networks so that we can do serious machine learning. Um, but, uh, absolutely, so actually something that I uh, sh uh, should have finished my talk with is um, I am not uh, suggesting computational neuroscientists out there to go and jump on neural market hardware. I think that would be a very bad idea uh, because hardware as we have it, it's not really fast. It's not really precise. It's hard to use. And uh, you know, it's, a, it's a PhD project uh, uh, in itself. Instead, you th I think you can think of neural market hardware as being a goal. Like this is what we'd like to do. Um, and if you do it this way, then you, you think of software and algorithms and hardware in very specific ways that can guide your research and build more neural market uh, algorithms. And the Cerberus kind of systems or the graph core, basically these large scale computing systems with memory and compute close to each other. I think that's the kind of uh, architecture that might be really useful for exploring neural, spiking neural networks and to the larger company or community. Right. On the other hand, we had a talk today by Sonder where he showed some nice results where he could solve essentially something that a confident with millions of units could solve with just uh, 200 spiking neurons. So do you think there's hope or what do you think? No, I, I, think I think that's great. I mean, that's, uh, that's certainly true that you can do, you know, because we have, we also had some similar observations that, you know, when you add this temporal component to the problems, then you can really save a lot of neurons, it's just that the network is probably well adapted to the problem. Um, it, it, there will arrive, however, a point where, you know, you need larger networks. I mean, we're not talking about millions and billions like you would have with GPT, right? but, uh, uh, but um, you know, rather in the hundreds of thousands of neurons. And that's just not easy to train on that. I mean, you can't do back prop through time on hundreds of thousands of adapters. Right. I think so maybe, 
maybe uh, yeah, we, I would be curious to hear. So France uh, showed today, for instance, that uh, they can train spiking neural networks to play computer games, essentially. And and would you agree with Amber's uh, point of view that really the ability to train larger networks is really what's bottlenecking now progress here? Or what's your what's your take on it? Oh, I didn't but, say that. <laughs> uh, I also want to add that right, um, uh, we don't really know actually if um, uh, if we have now larger spike neural networks, if the current training methods that we actually have uh, uh, really can make use of the much larger networks, right? So, for instance, um, uh, all kinds of uh, techniques that are somehow connected to um, surrogate gradients or any uh, kind of approximation of um, this um, derivative of the spike, right? Uh, I think, uh, I mean, at least I do uh, currently not know if uh, one can train uh, networks that have like a, like a really large number of units, right? And why not? Why do you not know this yet? <laughs> so what's bottlenecking you essentially on the technical side from doing this right now, right here, while talking to us? Is this I mean, a memory think, constraint uh, or? Uh, yes, I think so. I think uh, uh, the reason uh, why we can make such nice progress uh, is that because we can use like all the machine learning tools that are out there. Uh, and of course, uh, that includes GPUs. And so it's uh, very um, uh, just uh, convenient uh, to work with such uh, GPUs, right? You uh, decide you want to try something out and the hardware like supports um, every kind of computation that you want to, um, to test, right? So the, 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 the case of a spiking network is like really a special instance in how you can apply a GPU run. Right, yeah. But I guess my question is, why can't you use the GPU to now train these big networks and ask the question or answer the question that you pitched earlier, saying really big networks? Because in a way, TPUs or GPUs are being used for very, very big networks. But specifically for the spiking networks, what's really holding us back at the moment? Other than what Emma already said, maybe we need these dedicated systems. Um, well, I, I, you I, think you think sorry, but you you think basically, if I understand you correctly, you're saying maybe actually also the learning algorithms could be a limitation. Uh, yes, I mean, what's holding us back? Uh, uh, well, I think with when you have like a, a much greater network, so it becomes uh, uh, maybe also slower to train, right? It's more cumbersome to do something. But in principle, I think we could uh, uh, test uh, much larger networks already now, right? So if someone says he has like a few hundred neurons uh, in his approaches, uh, our networks uh, were in the same kind of regime, uh, I think it would be possible to, uh, to have neurons uh, uh, two orders of magnitudes uh, uh, larger in size, right? Are there any other opinions or views on what the field yeah. needs the most? Well, Friedemann, and I, I, I maybe I'm, I'm even I might be behind here, um, but I recall when we looked into it a few years ago that, for instance, sparseness support in in things like PyTorch and TensorFlow was actually not that well implemented. Like it's either there or it's not there, but it's not efficient. Like it's actually faster to do the full matrix rather than use the sparseness support. It must be possible to do that a lot more efficient. I think the BSIM uh, libraries, for instance, do that better. So, so I, if you want to go bigger with the networks, that's probably the low-hanging fruit. Then the question is, why do you want to go bigger? So we need to get more ambitious problems uh, solved in, in, in that respect. But if you can play Atari, if you can re recognize Timid, well, we're getting a long ways. But if you want to do these uh, self-supervised networks, I think that would not be feasible right now. If you want to train those networks with spiking neurons, it, it's not going to happen. So we're, we're at the edge where it takes up to a week to train a single network. And that's not really fun anymore. No, it's uh, not. <laughs> so uh, I actually have one uh, couple data points on what you just said. So uh, we did have a small project here in my lab where we tried to build basically spike-based operators for you know, PyTorch. So you can do that matrix multiplication rather than doing it as a dense operation, do it as sparse one. Um, and uh, it turns out that 
you can gain a factor that's you now close to the sparsity factor um, in uh, compute speed in inference dynamics. Things become much more complicated in, in uh, training dynamics. And as soon as you move, and I think this is a key point here, as soon as you go to convolutional networks, the benefit is almost zero because convolutional networks, if you think about it, it's also kind of a sparse computation and GPUs are just so well built for that. The whole software framework is very well built for that. So that was the point where it said, okay, so maybe, you know, there's, there's a fundamental uh, issue here that um, just don't need to fix. Right, so bigger and to go bigger, perhaps we need more sparseness in our software libraries. And, and I see actually uh, a couple of points um, in the chat, but I wanted to ask if any of those, of those who wrote something would like to actually articulate those points here on video. Um, so, Boyan, Boy, Boyan, now Gabriel or Jacob. Okay, I can add something maybe. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think what, what currently limits us. Uh, is I mean, of course, the GPU time is an issue and the GPU size and the memory sizes and everything, but it's more the human time that is needed to manually tune all the meta parameters <laughs> and, uh, and, and also to, 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 to try and test the different flavors of, you know, surrogate gradient learning because there are many, you know, like the shape of the surrogate gradient and whether you do a, a soft reset of a hard reset or there are many, many different flavors, as you know, and currently we have no theory to guide us. And the same is true for deep learning, by the way. I mean, in deep learning, the, the, the theory is, is still very limited. So there is a lot of time that is very wasted in uh, just, you know, they, they call it grad student descent, you know, because they take many grad students on the same <laughs> uh, problem and one of them is going to find the best solution but there is no theory to guide us so I think uh, this is what we should focus on <laughs> to build a theory to help us. So the way this could possibly even be shared with the architecture search that's currently going on also in deep learning right so that where, where effectively many of similar problems also arise maybe not yes. with respect to the surrogate gradients but how do you set up your network Yes. So then maybe your argument is also that perhaps we could benefit largely from a continued close collaboration with deep learning where then the, the boundaries become blurry and softened. Yes, and that is true. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. So then Mihai actually had another point um, in, I think, in that he actually agreed with Emma's point, first of all, and um, and he says he can't come on video, but what he wrote in the chat is um, that he thinks it's very important that we actively incorporate neuromorphic substrates into our computational neuroscience research um, to accelerate um, this research, I guess, and perhaps also make it faster in the end to screen all these parameters that you just mentioned, Tim. Um, and he further says that any theory or model claiming biologic plausibility needs to demonstrate a significant level of robustness to substrate variability. It's easy to fall into the trap of overtuning your models if all you use are software simulations. So is this something that actually any of you has experienced? There's not so many people actually doing this on hardware just yet, um, but perhaps we have somebody here who has tried Emre has used digital hardware, so. Oh yeah, no, we've, we've also used uh, analog uh, hardware in the past. I mean, there is a huge gap between what you can do in hardware and what you can do in math, right? Um, but it, I think it still, it remains very important to, to do these kinds of uh, software simulation because it gives you actually uh, a guiding principle on which you can build uh, the hardware as well. Now, it remains very important as you do your simulations, also to you know, take into account the noise that you might uh, have in, in, in different parts of the network. But I completely agree with the comment that you know, the real point where the rubber hits the road is basically when uh, you implement this in hardware. So it's important to work also with hardware people. I was just saying that, you know, don't go ahead, just run into neuromorphic hardware or you might be disappointed with that right now. Sounds like this might have happened to you at some point almost. 
No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Okay. Are you still safe, Emre? You're on the road uh, here, yeah? So please don't leave okay. anything dangerous here while on this Zoom discussion. So there was another question uh, to Emre and the others um, by Gabriel, who can't find the raise your hand feature. But his question is, instead of seeing GPUs and neuromorphic chips as rivals, uh, could we imagine a world where all online embedded technology use neuromorphic hardware, but GPUs are still prevalent for offline applications? And some hybrid approach like for the online few shot DVS learning. Maybe seeing technologic, technologies rivals isn't productive, like for event-based and uh, classical cameras. Um, so if I understand the question correctly, uh, the question is, could we have a bit of best of both worlds? Is this correct, Gabriel? Uh, yes, yeah, sorry, exactly. Okay, you're, you're actually, your microphone works. You could have asked the question yourself. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I was trying to find a, a good one. Ah, yeah, that's fine, sorry. But it was more like a broad kind of a remark, but uh, I was more, my main interest is more on event-based cameras. And sometimes it's better to see actually technologies are complementary and maybe like the benchmarks for one is not gonna be applicable to the other. Yep. So it was just a, a general question as if can we imagine just a, this kind of hybrid approach in other tasks and other fields. Yeah, so I think your question is, um, is a important question, but it now I mean aims mostly at the at the hardware level, and maybe I can comment already on part to the answer. Hopefully, is I think that uh, Sander made an important point in the beginning that a lot of the libraries at the moment actually don't support sparseness and things like that. And so, and if you actually look at these libraries, as Emery pointed out, they're often optimized for GPUs, which is why their sparseness support is so poor. However, um, if you were to implement them on CPU, often their sparseness support is much better. So there seems to be some kind of um, also library factor or software factor in the end, uh, where the software which has allowed the field to grow so quickly is really tailored to a specific type of hardware. Whereas for event-based systems, uh, like spiking neural networks, in principle, the and the CPU might be much more suitable. And that was the original motivation for building all these spiking network simulators because um, this, the sparseness of spikes was just more efficiently handled on CPUs. And if I remember correctly, Dan might even uh, want to comment on this uh, because last time I checked, Brian um, one or two uh, had GPU support, but often it wouldn't give very big speed ups uh, for this reason, but I'm not the expert here. Uh, and the, the issue for the speed ups on GPU is is with uh, STDP specifically, because basically to get STDP running fast, you need to essentially propagate spikes both forwards and backwards direction. Um, and the way you make GPUs run efficiently is by making sure all of the data get, that gets accessed in parallel threads all lives together. And you can ensure that happens in one direction, but you can't ensure that happens simultaneously in two different directions, basically. Um, so basically you, you get good speed ups as long as uh, you're not doing STDP, but STDP is kind of hard to accelerate. I mean, you do get some speed up, um, but not as much as you do for uh, more straightforward things. And I imagine a lot of the same problems are going to come up with computing gradients, although I haven't actually worked through the logic of that, I have to admit. Right, but like propagating something backwards sounds a lot like stuff that's being involved in exactly. computing yeah. gradients also. So at least in some of these algorithms, not all as we've, as we've learned today. Yeah, um, so you might have better luck with the algorithms that don't require you to, to propagate backwards, as it were. Right. I actually have one comment to make. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay, great. Um, so something that uh, we all do, uh, and this kind of our dirty trick, is that we always train in batches, right? Also on these GPUs. And if you don't do that, then you, your gain is zero, right? So you better run it on the GPU. 
And I think this is something to think about, right? Because it does kind of change the, the learning dynamics and what the network is actually, uh, the inputs that it's getting. And, um, and uh, you know, it's, there's no obvious way in which we can use GPUs for a single, uh, basically batch size equal one. So it's like just a comment I like to throw out there. Um, yeah. Thanks for the comment. I think, yeah, we've all experienced this and we've all swept it silently under the carpet. Um, but it's definitely, it's definitely an issue out there. Um, I have a quick uh, question to Aaron Felker, who has a thumbs up, uh, but I'm not sure if the thumbs up is meant as a hand up or not. Um, oh, that's just when you're explaining how to use the raise hand and that stuff. I was just giving the thumbs up for that. Oh, okay, okay. So it's just, yeah, I was just checking. So you don't, you don't want to contribute anything because nobody has their hand out. So I just thought, saw this thumbs up. So I thought maybe, <laughs> but thanks. I, I also haven't um, worked out where the hand up is. Actually, I also haven't worked it's it. my own Zoom room and I still don't know where it is. <laughs> no, it's, it's not here anymore. Someone did it, so it must exist. Yeah, I did that, uh, the hand up. Oh yeah, you uh, did it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Go ahead. I, yeah, yeah. I have some uh, before, some before you start with your question. Please tell everybody else where you found the hand up. Uh, I don't know. In my Zoom, there is a hand up, some acceptment and uh, deny on the chat room or something. I mean, if you click, there is some people call it the acceptance near the chat. Right. Now you can right. have the interface to know where to raise your hand up. It's right under the list of participants for me. Yes. Yeah, okay, it's not here for me, but okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. yeah, please go ahead with your question. Yeah, I mean, I just uh, give some comments for speed up the training of the spiking neural networks. At the beginning of my PhD, I do a lot of code checking that's uh, why mm, the TensorFlow and the Keras and even the PyTorch, and finally I choose the PyTorch. The TensorFlow and the Keras, most of them are support the statistic graph. So you know that uh, the, based on the Nifty's uh, st statement, the spiking neuron actually is a dynamic uh, computation graph. So the PyTorch perfectly, uh, perfect, perfectly have this function to calculate uh, the dynamic uh, computation flow. But uh, if you're training the RSTM in comparison with the training RSTM in comparison with the TensorFlow and the Keras, the PyTorch RSTM training is slower than the Keras. It's only because a, in the, I mean, I didn't read the source code, but in my understanding is like the Keras and the TensorFlow, they write down the RSTM and RN into the CUDA. So they have their CUDA optimization to running this recurrent uh, flows in the GPUs and they can speed it up. But I think in the PyTorch, because of the dynamic uh, computation graph feature, they cannot speed up this representation. So, so um, can, can I make a comment on that? Um, yeah. I don't think that's true. So the, there's, you can also fold the LSTM or spiking neuron dynamics inside the graph with these for loops, right? And yeah. I would argue that's actually a much better way to implement spiking neurons and use this as a configuration uh, tool. Um, so that's just want to make that comment there. It's not related to uh, spiking neurons. Yeah, I know. So yeah, because I do the training, so I need the back pocket. So I need to make the training diagram to be dynamic. But uh, I will try to um, build the code, use the Keras. Uh, I didn't make it, maybe I'm not that smart. <laughs> so now I'm training use PyTorch and uh, find a way to fit in the train weight into the Keras for the inference. Uh, it's only the comments, yeah. Okay, that sounds, yeah. of course, in the end of the day, it's great that it works, but it sounds a little bit painful that you had to go through all of this. Yes. Um, but yeah, that brings me actually to an important question that I, I feel we haven't really addressed is, which software tools do people use? Uh, and obviously everything seems to be relying on, on PyTorch here or TensorFlow at the, at the end of the day. But are there any kind of common software tools that anyone has developed uh, libraries on top of these or independent um, that actually can provide this kind of learning that we've seen today? 
um, or um, and, and specific, specifically, what are you using? And are you planning on making these things uh, publicly available? So who wants to comment on that? So I could say a quick comment. So I'm one of the developers for Nango, and we build support on Keras and TensorFlow and PyTorch as well. So we have workflows for basically converting between these different levels of abstraction and mapping it onto different levels of hardware. So that yeah, we use Nango and that's integrated with PyTorch and Keras for spiking networks. Does that allow for like the surrogate gradient approach? Because that's more than just like making it run on PyTorch, right? You also have to make some algorithmic changes to make it possible to, to do that. Yeah, uh, that's one thing that we're currently looking into is better support for different methods of training. So far, it's you kind of have to roll your own, um, mm. whether that be like specifying your own approximate gradient or putting in your own logic for what you want to do on the forward and the backward pass. But whatever you can write in TensorFlow or PyTorch, you can, in theory, uh, integrate into the sort of Nango workflow. But uh, yeah, we're working on ways of making it more uh, user-friendly and easier to use. I mean, we have the same um, issue with, with I, Brian. I oh, so sorry, I'll let Emery talk. Um, no, Dan, I think you should finish, I'm sorry. Okay, I was just gonna say, I mean, we, we were thinking about the same thing with Brian, and so far we're thinking about trying to get surrogate gradient descent to work, but it would be really interesting to know if there are other things that we should be thinking about to, to make this sort of work something that you can do with Brian, which you completely can't do at the moment, so. Um, yeah, go ahead, Emily. Uh, yeah, so I had a comment to make about, um, I mean, ultimately, you know, you're going to use something like TensorFlow or PyTorch, uh, which has static or dynamic graphs. Um, and that is actually going to make an impact on the kind of algorithms that you can implement and how far you can push this um, as you know, a framework that you can use for other types of hardware. Um, and I like to make the point there, and also it's relating to the previous gentleman's uh, question uh, or comment about these recurrent neural networks, that um, you should actually, I, I think if you're interested in like really uh, build, uh, scaling up neural networks, it's tempting to use PyTorch and its dynamic graphs, but it's actually a way of uh, uh, simplifying the problem because you're just unrolling the computations. Uh, it will be much more efficient uh, and future-proof if you actually use the static graph uh, um, uh, tools like TensorFlow and you know the other uh, tools like that. So I, th I think ultimately when you talk about gradient descent and surrogate gradient descent, it's going to boil down to what you can do with auto differentiation. And there's a whole world out there and different types of auto differentiation that are implemented. And fundamentally, PyTorch is not the same implementation as TensorFlow. TensorFlow is a data flow uh, a pipeline re representation and computational graphs and PyTorch is basically called uh, object uh, overloading. So these are very different, and depending which one you choose, you might end up in a, in a dead end at some point. All right, so there, there are actually a bunch of questions here popping up in the chat window because I think nobody knows where the raise your hand button is. That was smart by me to ask people to raise their hand. Um, so Colin, uh, oh wait, Colin asked a question for Sander, um, which is, Sander said that self-supervised spiking works aren't feasible, why not? And I, I'll try to answer for Sander, and if I'm wrong, please just shut me down. But I think Sander said that right now, it's, uh, it just takes too long um, to train spiking on networks to begin with. So some of their networks, which are not self-supervised, take a week now. And uh, typically the data efficiency for the self-supervised is lower by a factor of 10 to 100 uh, from what I've seen last. So I imagine that's probably what brings him down to a year uh, of training time. So I, I guess that's his point. And uh, please correct me if, that's, if that wasn't your point, Sander. Um, then Shavika. Um, so there's a long point here. Do you want to make it yourself, actually, in the chat? Do you want to come online? Yeah. So, uh, 
the limitation of an aromatic hardware. So I have the experience of working with Spinnaker. So there I tried to implement the balanced excitatory inhibitory network and compared its performance with the NEST, which is a software, a neural network simulator. So there I found that Spinnaker is less accurate as compared to NEST because it takes a lot of, uh, you know, uh, for example, we have to take so many factors into account, for example, time resolution in which we are running our simulations mm -hmm. on and yeah. other things to uh, get the asynchronous activity on the Spinnaker. Uh, but on NEST, NEST is more accurate when it comes to uh, simulating excitatory inhibitory network. So there it is easier to obtain the asynchronous irregular activity, which is the baseline activity of the of this kind of network. Yeah. But when you see the activity in the generated through the spinnaker, so activity is not completely asynchronous, rather there is some synchronicity. Mm -hmm. So it means that uh, there is accuracy some another factor apart from speed, although spinnaker is faster as compared to NEST, but uh, it is far less accurate. So I think that Accuracy is another factor which we have to look upon, uh, apart from speed, while implementing our network on neuromorphic hardware. But I'm not sure whether uh, uh, the implementation of spiking, how accurate the implementation of spiking neural network is on other on neuromorphic hardware when you compare it to other software simulators. Right. Yeah, I think that raises an interesting point, which is actually how much accuracy does one even need? Because if you think about deep neural networks. They often actively add noise and it makes them better, like such as drop connect or drop out. And I think for the hardware, the, the point that you're raising is an, is an important point, especially if you're training the network in software and then you're uploading it into hardware later and it performs differently, right? So I think ultimately what you have to probably do is to train networks on the hardware itself, either through uh, in the loop training or directly training on the hardware which I think lets you navigate a lot of these problems. Uh, but in the end of the day, I think it's a pretty much open question of how much accuracy uh, one needs and at which point it actually starts hurting you, especially because you obviously can't turn off noise entirely in certain uh, hardware architectures, which have like limited uh, precision weights, for instance, or things like that. But I think it's certainly a point to take into account and it's a trade-off, as you say. Yeah. Are there other comments uh, to this uh, comment, essentially? Uh, no, uh, not really. <laughs> okay, anyone else? Right. So maybe we summarize this part then, unless there's some uh, more pressing questions. Um, because I think, I think there's, there's lots of more questions in the chat window that I see right now. Um, but I would like to actually move also to the second topic before we kind of fill the hour. And uh, maybe we can quickly summarize what, what I remember, what we said. So like, obviously, um, limiting factors seem to be both at the software and the hardware level at the moment, uh, which don't allow us to go to bigger networks to train on more complicated problems. That's of course the application side where we are thinking um, maybe a car will be driven at some point by a spiking neural network. And I think that it needs to be work done yeah, both on the hardware and the software and making the two talk to each other. And I think Mihai had a good point saying that, look, we actually need to factor the hardware into the progress, um, which in return might help us to accelerate uh, these developments because then the hardware will allow us to simulate these things faster. Um, another interesting point was raised that maybe actually the, the limits are even algorithmic, right? So Franz said he doesn't even know whether EPROP would scale um, to these big networks or whether any surrogate gradient with backpropagation through time would scale easily to the spiking of networks. And I think one point that we haven't really spoken about because maybe nobody has really carefully, carefully looked at it yet is uh, the point of uh, how we initialize spiking neural networks. I think everybody probably has now the secret recipe of how to do this, but ultimately once you move to deep neural networks, initialization becomes really crucial. I think Julia mentioned it earlier, 
um, that it is an uh, absolutely crucial ingredient for their algorithm to work for the spike timing running. And uh, probably ultimately then there's some research that remains to be done to figure this out. Um, so I think that was, um, that was a problem from what I remember. Um, Dan, help me out. Is this, uh, is this an okay summary of the first part of the discussion? Or is there anyone else who would like to? I mean, I think I would like to add uh, mm -hmm. something. Uh, and that is, uh, we, we kind of uh, can train uh, recurrent neural networks, right? Uh, but um, we can then at least hope to be as good as uh, LSTM networks, for example, or something similar, right? And so uh, the recent developments in machine learning, so to say, uh, completely move away from recurrent architectures at all, right? So I think that's also a question of, of the underlying architecture, which in turn may also uh, impact uh, or maybe connected to initialization, right? Absolutely. I mean, uh, now ultimately a lot of people today had on their slides the biological inspiration of spiking neurons. So it's probably safe to assume that there are some inductive biases in this architecture, which might help learning. And I think most of us have just focused on neuron models and perhaps long time scales, for instance, like the work that you showed in these neuron models. Uh, but there might be others, right? There might be other biases in the biological architecture that ultimately helps learning and helps good generalization. Uh, do you want to take any wild guesses? What would be, in your opinion, the next thing from biology you would want to add to your networks to make them work even better? No, I think I, I do not know yet. <laughs> I can say anyone else from wild guess? I would like to add I would like to add cortical micro columns, but they come in at least ten thousand spiking neurons each. Right. Per, okay. And that takes a, a week. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's where it needs to scale up. So cortical microcolumns, laminar structure, different cell types. What? Yeah. Why? And and how are we going to tackle this with the issue that Tim raised earlier, with that we already have enough hyperparameters and spend too much time with the parameters of these things. Are you going to take? We, one could take Markram's. Uh, Column, of course, and now, now we can do backprop on it. Would that yeah. be the way forward? Some kind of an eprop approach with complex architectures with a well defined loss function. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, it's going to be my guess. But big, big networks, by the way. Yeah. Anyone else wants to comment on Sandra's comment? So what I found really intriguing today is, ah, okay, Colin. Colin Prepskius. Okay, he's just typing. Well, it brings us back to the problem of scale, right? I mean, those are very large networks. The neurons are very complex. It's nowhere near we can do anything at a practical scale today. So it just comes back to the same bottleneck of we need bigger hardware. Yes, I, I think for me, the question that I wanted to get is do we just need bigger or do we need smarter? And smarter, I, I was thinking along the lines what Sandra was saying, some kind of architecture that maybe the brain is using in its neurons or in its wiring diagram that might be helpful in including useful biases. So Colin just said is uh, it reminds him of a paper, which I think I know. Uh, and I think, yeah, so this is the Cindy Lerf paper that he just posted. Um, putting in an end to end to end, which is, if I remember correctly, a paper describing a different learning approach, which is uh, based on the contrastive predictive coding framework. Um, so, uh, which learns useful representations in deep neural networks without 
um, first of all, without propagating gradients through the entire network. So it solves part of the credit assembly issue. And second of all, um, it doesn't need supervision. So I think that's, yeah, that's a valuable point, a valid point here to make that probably we also should think about objective functions and loss functions and not maybe only focus on supervised. Um, but this brings us back to the to the old bottleneck that we need bigger and faster uh, ways of simulating these networks. Okay, so um, yeah, I've, I've one one to, small comment. I'm afraid I have to go. Uh, oh, okay. See you, Amrei. See you, Amrei. Okay. Thanks for thanks for coming in. Have fun. Thank you. Thank you. This was great. So I, I missed a, a few moments of the discussion because I had to go and see my daughter, but uh, uh, so may, maybe you covered this already, but yeah, there was this point about whether or not we should be doing the, the learning smarter by using interesting architectures. And I think that's that's definitely true. Like the brain is is much better at learning still than machine learning, right? Like we, we can learn with just a few examples of something. We can reuse what we've learned in one task for another task of all these things, but I don't think we should be waiting for that because the algorithm, those insights to know how we're doing that might take a long time to come. So I think we do need to be able to scale above what we can do at the moment until we get that. I mean, that, that should be an ultimate goal, but I don't think we should be hanging around waiting for that to happen because if once that's happened, it's too, it's too late. Like the, the big understanding is already there. Um, yeah, I, f I fully agree with this point. Like the one thing that every, Every time I do a surrogate gradient on a spike network makes me cringe is the fact that we represented spike trains as long arrays of zeros and ones and mostly zeros. So every time I train using the cluster, some spiking on networks, I feel like this is worse than Bitcoin mining. And, 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 that, and we really need to move beyond that. So algorithmically, I think this really has to stop. Um, and for that, somebody needs to just write a good library, <laughs> I think. And the, and the other thing that a good library needs to have is it needs to be easy to use, I think. Um, because, uh, yeah, it's that there, there is code already that can do this, right? Like, uh, like your SpyTorch tutorial, which is like half of what I'm doing now is basically taking your SpyTorch tutorial and then tinkering around with it to do some stuff. Oh my but, God, so uh, you're also multiplying zeros now. So I'm also doing it, yeah. So I, I'm, you know, I'm hammering those poor servers. Um, <laughs> But uh, but yeah no it's not straightforward if you if you don't and there's a lot of like subtleties and intricacies to it so I, I feel like yeah it's easy to use software is, is another critical thing. Okay yeah I agree. So like because I think people probably get tired. Um, I would like to move on unless there are really some really urgent last words on this topic. I'd like to get a little bit towards the biology. Okay, no very urgent words at the moment. Um, so the question is, and I sent this out, I think in the email, the question is really, we can train spiking the network now, but what now? That's the question. So how do we leverage this methodological advance to gain a better understanding of how the brain works uh, and how the brain causes information? And what concept, and what do we actually define as a conceptual advance, right? So. Um, we've seen this now also in deep learning that people find similar representations in deep neural networks um, that they find, for instance, in, in monkey brains that are looking at the same images. Um, at which point are we satisfied that this actually provides new insights and a new form of understanding? And further, how do we compare actually trying spiking on network activity in a similar way to these experiments I just mentioned to biology? Right. So this is, this is so, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't even know which metric we should use to directly compare spike trains, for instance. So does anyone want to comment on this? This is a very broad question, isn't it? I can maybe say a little bit. Um, we've been playing around with it, with these big CNN spike neural networks. Uh, we know that CNNs are better models of visual cortex than handcrafted 
deep layers. Uh, I'm not going to say it's a good model, but I'm going to say it's better. Uh, so we've been studying all kinds of uh, attention models in these visual systems. And um, once you have spiking neural networks, you, you can start thinking about the constraints that the brain has. Like uh, if you have attention, are you redeploying resources? spikes from one place to another. Um, what are you actually doing? So I showed something about modifying precision. This is kind of what inspired what, by, by what Carl Friston is, has been doing. So his, his thesis is that part of predictive coding is, is changing the precision of your internal model adaptively. Um, and we can compare that there are a lot of different adaptation or uh, attention models in, in the literature. And for that, having big spiking networks, and it's it's also it's still expensive to run. We can we start to get some answers. <coughs> so that's just an example. Um, it's still going to be a lot of convincing, I think, for biologists that this is a worthwhile effort in in terms of network research. But you think so? I like I've had rather positive feedback from biologists um, who were rather pleased to see that the spiking network in the computer actually does something. Oh, okay. Uh, we're going to see. <laughs> the paper is finished. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it, it, but it's, it's, uh, we also need fast hardware for that, by the way, because these networks are big and we're manipulating them. Some of the things we would like to do was learn with attention in the spiking network. Yeah. That's just not going to happen at the moment. So the, the, the models are very large and changing it on the fly is, is yeah, at least not going to happen for now, but I would like to do that. Yeah, yeah, me too, for sure. Um, is, uh, is Claudia Klopat still there by any chance? Claudia? She, she appeared for a while and then disappeared, unfortunately. Paging so I guess she had to go. Oh, um, yeah, that's a bummer. That was my mistake. I should call her up early because she, but she will talk about it tomorrow. I think yeah. uh, she has some interesting work actually on using this to, to build networks that resemble biology. So, um, we could also we could also try to get Dr. No, Dr. No, paging Dr. No. Speaker, I him in the list. Might not be here today. Yeah, I might not be here. Okay, too bad. I had a I had a thought about the the comparing to biology thing, which is I think whenever you're doing models, it's always hard to compare to biology, right? Like it's not like we've got a new yeah. problem here. Uh, what we should maybe focus on is is the new thing that we can do here, which is to specifically ask, what is it that specifically spiking neural networks can do? In other words, right, it's to try to maybe elaborate on the space of possible things that the, that the spiking might be doing. For me, that's the big question I would love to be able to answer. I'd love to be able to find something I can say, spiking neural networks can do this, is biologically relevant, and non-spiking networks can't do this. And I've kind of been looking for that my whole career, and I still haven't really found a, an answer to that question. But I feel like potentially these these mechanisms, the, these me algorithms that that we're we're talking about here, could actually find those answers. Um, I'm not sure that we're quite there yet, but that that seems to me the the exciting thing. And I think if we get an answer to that, then then we've got already something that we can then start testing against uh, generating hypotheses that we can start testing. Yeah. So yeah, it's a shame that Tim just had to leave uh, already, but I think he would probably uh, advocate largely for the fact that uh, if, as soon as you have time in spikes, which you can, you can have time also in recurrent neural network, but the fact that you have time intrinsically tied to a spike, you can order spikes and that, that order can actually mean something. Uh, and I think he's a big advocate for that. And that also reminded me of Julia's talk earlier today, um, where basically the entire encoding was in time. Um, yeah. Ah, perfect. Yeah. Hi. Right. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I agree with, a lot with what Dan said, and it would be really exciting to find something that spiking nets can do that conventional networks cannot do. And I think one important thing here is that most experiments that we do are somewhere at sensory level. So we're trying to recognize objects or audio or move like muscle or motor movement. But maybe if we thought um, at a higher level about cognition and how is it that we can understand more complex
complex things and I don't know do mathematics or physics or understand the, the world that we live in or you know more complex tasks like that maybe that's something that uh, cannot really be done efficiently uh, with conventional networks I don't know but it would it would be cool to, to get a result like that because if you are just at sensory level at the level of classifying things it's sort of easy in a way so it's sort of easy to to find networks or uh, learning systems of any kind maybe that can solve those problems but if you think at a higher level and also if you think not just in terms of solving problems but in terms of what sort of behaviors can we generate because we're not as humans we're not just um, machine learning biological robots we're we are creative beings and we function in some way in our environment um, so yeah it's not necessarily all about uh, learning when you think about if, if you want to try to understand the biology. So what might the answer be like? I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I, I just think that it would be cool to, to go in that direction, but uh, I don't have a good answer myself at the moment. Venkar, do you have an idea? Or did you? I'm just here to ask the question. Sorry. Dan, okay. uh, what okay. might the answer be like? <laughs> yeah, yeah, if I knew that, like... I would be doing it, right? Um, <laughs> All right. <laughs> no, no, actually, I mean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't which, which is the case, actually. I mean, like, I, I think auditory is a really interesting domain for spiking neurons, actually, because, first of all, I think that the, the benefits that you're going to get with spiking are problems where temporal information, particularly on multiple and very rapid timescales, um, is very important. Uh, and I think auditory is brilliant for that. Like, particularly problems like listening in noise, where you potentially have to switch very rapidly uh, between listening and not listening, uh, integrating information, not integrating information, in order to be able to sort of focus your attention in on the, the, the area, the, the, the moments in time and frequent and, and, and in the spectrum where the information is actually good and not just dominated by noise. So you've got all sorts of potential advantages of, of using spiking networks in um, an auditory context. The other one that I think could be pretty important would be um, things like, um, I think that there's quite, I mean, I'm not an expert in this, but I think there's quite a difficult problem in robotics in getting robots to grip an object because they either like crush it with their you know, overly strong hands or they just let it slip. And the, the problem is about, getting, is about acting very rapidly on the, on the feedback so that it can get the pressure just right, right? So that it doesn't slip, but that they don't crush it. Uh, and it's kind of hard to do that if you have to integrate for 100 milliseconds, do some computation and then do your action because it's already fallen. Uh, with a spiking neural network, potentially you can really quickly integrate that information and, and, and feedback on it. Um, so, so that's a couple of ideas, but I, I don't think anyone's like conclusively demonstrated anything that, that really shows the benefit there. Yeah, but I think the neuromorphic guys are onto it, um, building those robots. So Gauta had, an, uh, had a point, which I, I think a lot of people have this point, so I'm going to read it out. Uh, so could it be that spikes are just the best way for the brain to represent the firing rate? Dan, I'm asking you. Is it like in a way, in a way, um, if you think about it, right? Uh, if you could just have a firing rate that arbitrarily fast, or a signal which can change arbitrarily fast, right? Then you're very close to actually what a spike train is. So that's usually the kill argument when I'm trying to advocate along similar lines that you just advocated. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess the point is, yeah, it could be, right? Like, may, maybe maybe spikes uh, are not for anything. They're just for, uh, well, we're going to talk about more about this tomorrow, I guess. That's the, that's that's right. the subject yeah, of the I discussion tomorrow. But uh, yeah, maybe, maybe it's just uh, it's just purely energy efficient way of representing information. I mean, I kind of hope not, because it'd be more interesting if not. But anyway, let's talk about more about that tomorrow. Yeah, yeah I mean, maybe, maybe just quickly. Um, I, I, I was at some point thinking this for the last couple of years. and. 
Now, last year I was also on a committee and, and one of the a PhD students actually worked a biologist on models. And he really found in cortex aspects of these spiking neurons that have no relationship to inhibition and excitation or modulation. And they really seem to be about tuning the resonance frequency of your microcircuit, which doesn't have anything to do with the, the spike rate. And I find that intriguing. There's like this may be part of the reason why I say micro columns, if I would like to do that. That could be related to these ideas about uh, like Pascal Fries about uh, different columns syncing or, or desyncing in a dynamic way to, to guide information through a big network. Uh, but, so there might be more. I, I, I think so by now. Or maybe also the power of a spike is that you can actually smoothly interpolate completely from the timing only, as we've seen in the second talk today, uh, where, you, where every neuron spikes once, but it has timing and that's enough. And then you can go totally to firing rate and whichever is more beneficial, you're going to use that. Because activity, spiking activity in many brain areas is actually super duper low, whereas in some brain areas, like for instance, cerebellum, the um, the spike rate is relatively high. It's like often like 30 to 40, 50 hertz. So, um, so maybe maybe these neurons decide to do a little bit more rate coding, whereas other neurons, they might even be dynamically able to switch, as what Sander showed with attention, for instance, to increase their firing rate, and otherwise they decrease their firing rate, and maybe they then rely more on a timing code. Who knows? We have a hand up, Friedman. Oh. Yeah, I'm just looking at the chat. I'm like totally, yeah, Jan. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Oh, uh, this is very, actually very interesting. Yeah, I'm deep deep learning guy, and I'm I just joined to to see what you are doing, and uh, I'm actually quite surprised that you don't have the answer to this question. What the spike neural networks uh, will be better than CNNs in some some, some problems, and uh, actually why I started look at, at at this this problem and spike neural networks and uh, and this, this this learning algorithm is that my impression is that a brain is much better in learning unsupervised than anything I have seen in in deep learning. So, is this also your impression? And I, I started to look at heavy and learning, but you, you don't talk about heavy and learning at all. You talk all the time about about uh, supervised learning. And this is kind of, okay, maybe interesting, but what do you think about, about this? Can you comment? Yes, maybe I actually can. I could actually start on this one, unless, um, like I'll just start. So I spent probably most of my PhD working on Spiking networks with heavy and learning. And at the end of the day, these networks just didn't do very much. Um, so, which really empirically, like a lot of people I know and a lot of people are here um, have worked on this. Empirically, we just think that heavy and learning alone is not enough. And there is some kind of secret sauce missing. And at the moment, obviously, um, the excitement about being able to train spiking networks with machine learning methods is already a step forward, but I, I totally agree with you that the brain um, does like extremely well at unsupervised learning, but we just don't really know if that's intrinsically linked to spiking or not, right? So, uh, or whether it's more of a question of architectures and objective functions rather than how you lay information between neurons. That's my take on it. But now I call the other panelists here on stage to answer. I think it's a, it's a good question. I'm, I think uh, probably uh, there are uh, several uh, views uh, that one can take here. Because um, uh, even if we do not know uh, if uh, spiking output has like a computational advantage, right? Uh, we do know that um, spiking uh, networks uh, can be implemented very efficiently, right? And so maybe that is the reason why uh, nature kind of uh, converged to this concept as, uh, as, as the core of information processing. So, yes, I agree that 
I think there are two things that we know for sure that spiking networks, at least in biology, can do better than hypothetically than rate-based networks. So one is energy efficiency. In general, this type of comp computing is more energy efficient. And the other is that um, uh, the first response to a stimulus is based on single spikes. So you can make a very fast first response. Then it might be rate-based and so on. Um, but there are these two things that we know for sure. Any more comments to Jan's question? Why no heavy in learning? Otherwise, uh, we go on to Aquas. So I actually want to comment on the heavy and learning question. Oh, perfect. Uh, from the neuromorphic perspective, if we would like to build neuromorphic hardware, which is not only a machine learning accelerator, so not only an accelerator for the inference, but it should actually do something like self-learning, ongoing plasticity the whole time. Then we need something like Hebbian learning, which does not have to be Hebbian, but local. So we need a plasticity rule that comes out, actually works with locally, observ locally accessible observables. So in this sense, we need something like Hebbian learning. And how this gradient actually arrives at the, plas at the synapses it doesn't really matter. It can come from the structure. It can come from the network activity. For example, in the case of equilibrium propagation or the backpropagation with multiplexing. I think it was Friedemann's paper, uh, quite new one. And we shall, we shall paper. We shall know ah. if you speak tomorrow. But yeah. But the, the, uh, that I mean, so it doesn't matter. Somehow the gradient has to arrive at the synapses and has to be accessible based on local observables. If our aim is to build a self-learning system, then we need that kind of local learning. Yeah, thanks for making this point. I think, yeah, I think it's an important addition to, uh, to Jan's question is that actually if you write down gradients, and I think Emre had this up on one of his slides earlier, if you write down gradients for any neuron, then typically you end up with this factorization where you have the Hebbian term, so pre and the postsynaptic term, and that's multiplied by this eligibility term in Franz Torp, or I think Emre also called it eligibility term, but there's this feedback term or error term which now modulates learning for this neuron. So it's really a three-factor learning rule. And the, the heavy part is actually always there. Um, but if you take away the feedback term, you're losing a lot of power. And I think that's what Akos also, also saying, that this can, can now come from different loss functions, from different sources. Maybe it's even the brain area, as we've seen in Franz's talk, that's generating these, these learning signals, how they were then also called. So yeah, usually we cannot completely get rid of something additionally, um, which encodes some information about the objective that the network ultimately has, uh, the learning objective, and that informs an individual neuron about the, the outcome or the output of the entire circuit. Thank you very much. Hello. Interesting. Yeah, thanks for asking the question. Now, do we have any other questions? Um, so usually I wanted to actually ask uh, one of the, yeah, they're not here anymore, so. So who's planning on using any of these type of models for neuroscience research? Other than Dan, who I know who, who is, you come last. Let's see if there's anyone else who's planning on. And then importantly, how are you planning on comparing what your model does or what your model computes with the brain? I guess we're unlucky. Neuroscience is unlucky. Hi. No, maybe not. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. There are still with you. Hi. Um, <clears throat> I'm working um, at a psychiatry department in Heidelberg. 
actually close to the Neuenheimer Feld where um, also a lot of neuromorphic hardware is developed, but uh, I'm more doing like standard simulations. I've used Prime like ages ago. And, um, but I'm just starting a postdoc actually uh, shared here, here and uh, at Carl Friston's lab at UCL, trying to connect basically his free energy principle active inference framework to spiking neural network models. And uh, the idea is um, basically most of the classical work in like functional imaging psychophysics centers on mean values, like the mean probability of choosing the right response in a task, for example, or like the mean reaction time, if you do a right choice or if you do an error. And uh, the nice thing about spiking neural networks is that they have this inherent kind of stochasticity or nonlinear dynamics, however you want to call it which hopefully will also allow us to model um, the full distributions on reaction times, choices, and everything. And the idea would be to have um, spiking models that perform a very simple, close to sensory motor um, task, and uh, for which we will also have data from an EG experiment. And the hope would be to be able not only to fit like individual um, mean errors or reaction time means, but also like the full distributions. And uh, we are just getting started on this and it will be a long journey, but uh, there are some ideas we already have from using some uh, variational approaches to using uh, invertible neural networks. Basically, there is a lot of mech machinery that allows you to fit posteriors about model parameters, like few model parameters, just like very simple NMDA, AMPA, GABA conductances, just like four or five parameters that we really tune to fit the data, um, just having a simulator. Yeah, so um, that's what we hope are hoping to achieve in the next couple of years. Sounds very cool. And what what aspect would you actually then compare to EEG, you said, right? So how do you, from the network simulation, how do you get the EEG in there? Um, so the idea would be that hopefully something like a winner-take-all circuits or some meaningful kind of sub-ensembles develop if we train the network to do the task using BPTT, for example. And uh, we would fit basically the reaction time distributions and the choice distributions. And then we would kind of use the total number of spikes per trial as kind of a very indirect proxy for like event create potentials and then see how far we get with this. Cool. Thanks for sharing this project. Sounds yeah. exciting. And um, yeah, it sounds also exciting that you could in fact use some of these methods to fit the NMDA time scale parameters or all the other parameters in the end. And then the only question is um, how, how well will this behave basically? How, how well, how sure are you that you're not stuck in a local minimum in the end? But it's definitely-, definitely Yeah, that's why it's science, yeah. Thank yeah, you all. Exactly. <laughs> cool. So is there anyone else who has some idea of applying this actually to an interesting neuroscience question um, for model building essentially? And who wants to share this? Because otherwise I think we can also then postpone this discussion to uh, tomorrow's why spikes discussion. I take it that also probably people are getting tired now um, but maybe one last closer question um, is, yeah. So one last question to close this out is like, what, what in your opinion, what are the loss functions or the, the cost functions that the brain optimizes? This you know, draws on the remark that Jan made earlier um, that why not heavy learning? And also Akos commented that uh, it can come from various places, but in your opinion, and we just heard uh, also uh, by uh, Kai the, the idea about um, a free energy principle. So predictive coding, what are your guesses essentially what the brain 
or what parts of the brain are trying to optimize and what's essentially next, the next loss function is going to be from plugging into one of these spiking neural networks to try this out. So I think, um, uh, I think there are probably many different loss functions at work, right? So uh, uh, brain areas uh, that uh, kind of uh, connect to different parts, maybe, uh, or consider, let's consider uh, brain areas that are closer to sensory processing, right? So maybe they kind of apply more like supervised uh, learning kind of loss function, uh, unsupervised, sorry, unsupervised kind of loss functions. And uh, different other parts, uh, this uh, kind of uh, reward based learning system, which is already identified in the brain, uh, probably has a lot to do with uh, kind of reinforcement learning, right? Which uh, could uh, exhibit plasticity rules that look uh, very much different to these other kind of uh, brain areas then. But that's just one thought, right? Right, yeah. Um, yeah, I agree with this. I think there are many things that the brain is trying to optimize at the same time and different areas have somewhat different um, functions and their specialized areas. Um, so it's really a, a matter of how you how you want to look at it. And in general, probably no model is really wrong. So you can look at things, for example, in the framework of predictive coding, and then you can say, okay, the idea of loss functions, it's sort of an epiphenomenon when you think about predictive coding. So it just arises from from the fact that the brain is trying to make a model of reality. But then if you also, if you start from the idea that the brain optimizes for loss functions, you can also think, well, okay, the idea of predict predictive coding is also valid because by optimizing so many functions, you put them together and then you create a model of reality. So it's more like different layers of explanation that are not really mutually exclusive. Um, Very well. Good. I think I think maybe it's then also time to run this up. I thought it was uh, really insightful for me and really exciting to listen to all these ideas and also to have um, so much more um, audience contribution now in this more um, small scale framework. And I thought it was great. And I would really like to apologize to all the people who have written something in this chat and I, whose questions I haven't picked up now because, um, because I'm, yeah, I'm just not really good at this, at keeping track at which ones I already read. So I'm really sorry. Um, so if you still have something burning to say or to ask them, please, um, then please write now that uh, we get you here online. And otherwise, I think we're closing the session now for the day. Um, we'll be back tomorrow at um, 2 p.m. This is Central European time, so Zurich time. Um, and I'm sure that you all can convert this <laughs> with Google um, to, to your local time. And it would be really great to have, again, such a vibrant and big audience tomorrow. And some more cool questions tomorrow will be a, a little bit more focus on the biology side, if I'm looking at the program. Again, four talks, same format, and then a discussion session uh, after, which is why spikes. Uh, so we already got a little bit in this discussion, so I'm, I'm sure this is going to be very lively tomorrow. And um, yeah, so thanks again to all the speakers. Thanks again to Dan uh, for organizing this with me. And thanks again to everybody who stuck it out for so long and came. And um, yeah, it's been really great and a lot of fun. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you to you, Friedman, for keeping the discussion going. It was great work. Yes. Thank you. This was fun. Thanks. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank you. Bye bye. See you everybody tomorrow. Bye everyone. Bye.